coming together of women in the labor movement with women in the movement against violence against women, I think unlike anything that's ever really happened before. V-Day, as you know, is the movement that was inspired by Eve's play, The Vagina Monologues. It is now inspiring One Billion Rising. How many of you all know about One Billion Rising? Good. On February 14th of next year, one billion women and the men who love them will rise to stop violence. This is what I love about Eve. It's not just kind of against. We're not just indicating that we're kind of negative and down on violence. Um, it's to <laughs> stop violence. And this evening is really about talking about that word violence. What is it in our lives? When do we recognize it? When do we not recognize it? What are the root causes for it? What connects the violence that we feel in our homes with the violence that we might feel in the workplace? What voice do we have to talk about any of these things? What mechanisms do we have to stop the violence that affects our lives 24-7? We have um, teachers and nurses and domestic workers and lawyers and our grassroots organizers all here to try to flesh out how do we move forward. So I think what we're here to say is to say that women are not the ever elastic rubber band in our economy. We're not going to endlessly take up the slack for cut services, cut rights, cut access. And we're not gonna keep private what you've privatized, which are the problems of society. Exactly. So what I wanna ask each of you to do is to tell us very concretely, make it public what you are seeing. Because we count on teachers and nurses and domestic workers to handle it. Um, I want you to not handle it for a minute. Karen, start with us. I'm I should say on. Karen has been a nurse for, did you say 37 years 37 in Boston? 37 years, yep, yes. And my Boston accent's coming out. There you are. <laughs> yeah. What do you see every day? Well, I'll tell you, we're an organization that, you know, this is, just where we should be. We're an organization that's 95% women. Um, so the issues that we face as workers as well as healthcare providers uh, becomes very personal to us. Uh, one is we continue to fight because we have a big issue because of the economy. We're seeing more and more of uh, the fallout and we're seeing more and more violence occurring. Um, I think they said now somewhere around 48% of all non-fatal assaults in this country are um, healthcare workers. And it's just not nurses, but it's, it's everyone. And we obviously are having that fight against employers that do not want that word to get out. You know, it, it is not acceptable. And we've been told it is uh, by judges in courts that if you work in mental health and you get beat up, it's part of your job. Um, I don't believe you would tell a police officer that. That we are watching people coming in um, into the hospital and we're seeing more and more women coming in. Um, not with, you know, you think, oh, you know, with domestic violence, that's what it is. No. Women have become much more the breadwinners. Women are now very much single moms taking care of their family and in, in most cases have a spouse that is no longer working. The stress of doing that and continuing to try to provide everything else that they provide, because as you know, women are multitaskers, that they're coming in much sicker. Um, they're coming in now with much more heart disease than we've ever seen before, and it's getting to the point where heart disease in women is becoming a bigger killer than cancer in some cases. And women are the highest number that are living in poverty in their senior years than any other group, and this is an unacceptable event. And then we turn around and have an economy that is talking about cutting Social Security. Are we out of our minds? <coughs> when I think about the state of female America, and I think about the fact that we're more than half of the paid workforce. Mm -hmm. We're still doing the vast majority of family caregiving work. We're more than half of the electorate. We live longer than men. Mm -hmm. I actually think that the state of female America is the state of the whole of America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that our issues, our concerns, our lives, our hopes, our dreams can be relegated ever to any kind of a, a special interest, right? Mm -hmm. It's about the future and the well-being of our country. So I see this huge gap between our rhetoric and the reality. And as a result, people need to marginalize those of us who are organized. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get the demeaning, the dividing, and then the defunding.
And that's what I've seen happen all across America. We cannot get into a defensive crouch or a victim crouch. We need to feel our power and feel it together and understand that when we are together and we shout this out and we actually come up with solutions that help those we serve, we are uniting a community for a better way. And I think in some ways the most profoundly um, disturbing piece is to be so discounted that you're not in any way considered to be important enough to even be named. Mm -hmm. That kind of silence that leaves you invisible at the same time that you're marked and targeted means that the ability to resist and to build a different world is the only thing that you can hold on to for the possibility of the kind of change you need. One of the consequences of the reversals that we've been seeing, and we've seen them, for example, in efforts to try to provide protection in the Violence Against Women Act and how the Supreme Court overturned that. Um, we saw it last year when women Walmart workers tried to sue uh, because of the national consequences of discrimination that was uh, enacted against them by Walmart and the Supreme Court unanimously told them that they could not put together their experiences to tell a story about gender discrimination. So part of what I'm seeing is a pushback I'm seeing what Laura told me to describe. I call it disaggregation. It means all of these different ways that our story about what happens to us as women, as Eve said, we're able, we were able to put them together and come up with a story that we could identify as these are problems and injuries that happen to us as women. The courts are taking it apart, right? So violence against women isn't something that happens to women as a whole. It's something that happens to a few women, and we can't have laws to do anything against it. Discrimination as women isn't something that happens to women as a whole. It just happens state by state, or company by company, and we can't do anything about it. Feminization of poverty is not something that happens to women as a whole. It happens to subpopulations, and we can't talk about it. So what I'm seeing is a loss of our voice, a loss of our ability to say as feminists, as women who are concerned about economic violence as much as physical violence, that we all share these kinds of interests in common, even though some of us are experiencing these issues historically more than others. My sense is if we had the ability to address this 20 years ago, if we had the ability to see in structural adjustment policies that were happening in the third world exactly what was going to happen here, if we were able to say, look, it's not just what's happening in Honduras or Panama, but this is happening here in our own communities and will eventually happen to all of us, then we'd be better prepared to address some of these issues. Start with what you think the connections are between violence, vaginas, vulnerability, <laughs> Well, you know, I, I've just been sitting here thinking about, um, and I think about this a lot, like 15 years working on stopping violence against women and, and what that's been about and how every single time you go to work on one aspect of violence against women, you're working on race, you're working on homophobia, you're working on, you're working on poverty. They're absolutely inseparable, but they're separated. <laughs> okay, here we each are in our own individual silos, right? And there's something about the way all of these movements got separated and fragmented from each other that has kept us all just where we are. That's kind of what you were talking about, Kim, right? Yeah. The disaggregation. And, and that whole thing about retraction. And, and, and I was thinking about how that's actually, I always talk about my father when I think about violence, because he was so violent. But the worst crime of my father was actually not raping me or throwing me against walls. It was dividing me from my brothers and sisters. Mm. That's where I could really cry. That he made one of us special and the other is not special, and one of us more important than the other. And we were all disappeared, but we, were, we, were, we had gradations of our value in the disappearance. Mm. And in a way, that's kind of what's happened in our movements, that we have all are in the same suffering or in the same story, but we've all gotten divided in the house, you know? We're in the same house, but we're in all these different rooms. And I think, really, I know now, after 15 years of doing this work 12 hours a day, that unless we bring the house together, exactly. there will be no 
ending of violence against women. There will be no ending of any kind of violence. The violence of poverty, the violence of racism, the violence of homophobia, there will be none. Well, if you go back 200 years, who was working in the factories? It was women. Mm -hmm. You talked about the Lowell factory anniversary. The first factory jobs were women's jobs because the men were working the farms and they didn't think there was an, uh, you know, the, the, they, were the, they were the surplus labor uh, women who went to work in the factories. How did those factory jobs somehow 100 years later become men's jobs such that after the Civil War and at the turn of the century, women were being shoved out of some of those jobs? Well, it was because they were made, they, they, well, they became unionized jobs, and when they became unionized jobs, they became valuable jobs. Mm -hmm. And when they became valuable jobs, they somehow magically became more male jobs. Um, so I want to talk about that. How did we end up with unions in, the, in, in teaching? Yay. How did we end up with unions in, in, in nursing? Yay. Domestic workers are getting there. Um, how do we do it? And how do we not lose ground? And then we want to you know, expand this to how do we make some progress, because we have made progress over the years working collectively. Mm -hmm. So I think even though these are economic issues, I find that if you look at the arc of history in terms of um, teacher unionization, public service unionization, and we represent a whole bunch of nurses as well, nurse unionization, mm -hmm. it's all about dignity. There I go with the D words, but this is a positive D word. <laughs> it's all about dignity. People will take the risk to fight against their fear and go on strike when they have no rights, as New York City teachers did in 1960, when they had no rights. Forget about the Taylor Law. No rights. You could be fired. That's it. People go on strike when it's about dignity, and that's how union movements were created and have been created, not when you have a path of legal rights, which actually have been helpful, but that's how it started. The last two years, it was an evisceration strategy by the right. That's right. We have mm -hmm. never fought, at least in my generation, as hard and as fiercely as we have fought to maintain a voice for working people as we have in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And as Laura just said, I am seeing that opening now in a way that I hadn't seen in years. I use three words, solution-driven unionism, community-driven reform, and activists on the ground level. Mm -hmm. And when we have those three, it is combustible in the best way. We've got to talk honestly, We've got to figure out how to use the spirit that the unions embody in 2008 and 2012 and apply that to our own movement. That's when we can make sure that speaking collectively as women doesn't necessarily mean not speaking to all of the racial and class issues that we face as subgroups of women. Is there a relationship, and if so, what is it, between legitimate rape and... Yeah. Um, <laughs> Legitimate rape and acceptable austerity. <laughs> Eve. I'm not answering that first. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> Somebody else can go first. But <laughs> that soul has your name on it, though, Eve. <laughs> Say the question again. Laura. Legitimate rape. Well, there's certain kinds of rape we don't need to worry about. Right. And acceptable austerity. Well, there's some kind of people we can cut out. Yeah. There's right. a certain amount you can all tolerate, because, you know, the body just shuts down, that kind of thing. <laughs> Kim, I think you should start. I think you should start, Kim. I think Laura should start. Yeah. Yeah, really. There's a connection between legitimate rape and acceptable austerity. I'm trying to suggest that there's a language that's adopted about what's acceptable in our society, that we can somehow decide that this little bit over here is really okay. Yeah. And the more that we listen to the women that we're listening to here is that this little bit over here, if it isn't us right now, it will be us in a minute. And in fact, the us that we're talking about is everybody. So when Randy says we organize our power when we are confronted with issues of dignity. 
I can't help thinking about your video, Eve, that one billion rising, because that's a video of people claiming their dignity. Exactly. It's a vis the idea of rising is about coming out of degradation, demeaning, uh, dividing, and defunding, mm -hmm. and saying, no, I have D word dignity, and I'm rising. And I, I guess it was a question to try to segue us into how do we make one billion rising relate to the fights that we're seeing about austerity, the fights that we're seeing around dignity, and not lose the specificity of rape, the specificity of violence against women, because all violence is not the same, we don't want to shed differences here, but the passion mm -hmm. needs to come into the same ballpark. Mm -hmm. We need to be as angry about this invasion in our personal space that is called austerity, when we're working more hours than we could possibly have, when we're making ourselves sick for trying to look after everybody that we see uncared for. Um, I mean, I, I, that, gonna, talk about that a little bit. Laura, we're going to have to take on, we're really going to have to take on the economy as, as activists that don't leave that somehow next to the way that we understand class or race or gender. If we don't take this on, then we then become backseated to the way that the, that the country is, is, is being ripped apart by economic difference. Right. If we don't name that as our issue, if we don't say that's precisely where we're stepping completely in as each other's allies to name exactly the way that it applies in each of our communities so none of our communities get left out or marginalized in a conversation driven by the economy, then we don't come together. Mm. And it's a time, I think, for us to look at, I, for many, for me, I come out of the 70s, out of the 60s and 70s and radical movements in those times. And when women's liberation was what feminism was called, and it, was a battle around class and race, a lot exactly in, that, right. in that movement yes. for women, and whether women had rights or women wanted to, be, to, to create a new vision of the world that embodied a completely different reality of gender. And that conversation can't, has to be reimagined Absolutely. now, mm -hmm. now, because people do work to change their lives, not just from anger, but from hope. Mm -hmm from dignity, from the way that it is that you imagine the possibility of a world that doesn't sit on you the way it does, but can sit on everybody differently and in a shared way. And we have to name what it is that's different between us, the ramifications of those differences, and the way our organizing shifts because of it, so that we do the work together as each other's allies, rather than trying to say we're the same. Mm -hmm. exactly. It's got to exactly. stop. I, I can't Ijen, do it. I just want to bring, I'll bring the two of you, but Ijen, I want you to just bring in for a second, <laughs> caring across generations, because you yep. are doing the economic organizing, but in a different way. You're talking labor and yep. economics, but you're talking caring at the heart of it. How is that going down? <laughs> um, well, I'm a campaigner. I, I believe in campaigns because I, I have this metaphor that I think that campaigns are like great love affairs um, because they are these incredible containers for transformation where because you're moving, you're in motion together with people, you transform, your relationships transform, how you see the world transforms, how you get connected to issues transforms, and you're moving towards something together. And it's incredibly powerful and transformative. And domestic workers have launched together with seniors and people with disabilities and their families um, and women's organizations and family caregiver groups and veterans, all the people who need care and are going to need care, which is all of us, um, together with the workers who are providing that care, home care workers, domestic workers, we've launched this campaign called Caring Across Generations. And it's all about how do we actually look at the ways in which we're already connected, interdependent, Right? We're already part of the same vision for this country, um, which includes all of us. 
right? And it's rooted in care. We should be a country that takes care of each other across generations, right? Mm -hmm. What else make for? And who, who can't see themselves inside of that vision? And so that campaign is all about how do we bring these interests and actually demonstrate the ways in which they're one and the same. The aging white electorate with the rising immigrant workforce, low wage workforce, and African Americans who've been home care workers for the last 20 years and in, in communities where there's a persistent underemployment. We're all part of the same vision for a new America. And how do we find the campaigns that allow us to be in motion together towards that kind of vision? Um, and I think One Billion Rising is one of those campaigns. One of the things I've been very moved by is, is looking at all the different reasons people are rising. And they're very different, you know? But we're all rising. And I was, really want to connect to something Kim was talking about earlier about incarceration, having spent a lot of time working with incarcerated women and, and, and being with incarcerated women. You know, I think one of the things we do a lot is we don't look at why and how and where people come from to get where they are. And I think it's a huge piece of why we're not coming together. Um, I think spending a lot of time with incarcerated women, you know, I think we focus on the outcomes and we focus on the, the, the deed that gets done after many, many, many years of oppressions and various disappearings. And I think one way that we could really move forward is to be looking at the person next to you and wondering how that person got there. Yeah. You know, what are the conditions that brought somebody to be violent? What are the conditions that brought somebody to be? Because I think there's a way in which we, we do this thing in America where people are, are such products as opposed to experiences or, 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 or lives or stories that, that begin somewhere and go somewhere. And I, it's connected up with care. Because I think when you start to care for people, you care for their history, you care for what's gone into bringing them to where they are. And I think in terms of the rising, I think what I'm really optimistic about is that even in all the countries I've been traveling to, there are different classes of people, different races of people, different ethnic groups, different tribes standing next to each other, owning their separateness, owning their differences, owning, but in the agreement that they want to change what is coming ahead of them. And I think it's, it's making that agreement together. It's, 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 and, and the last piece I want to say is that I think maybe it's from my own history or my own personal story, but the most invisible is the one to lead us. I've always believed that, the most invisible. The one we disappear the most is the one to lead us. So it's finding in any given situation who is the most disappeared there and letting that person lead the way because that's the person who has the most truth, ironically because they have been holding it and seeing it in a way where they're not talking usually, where they're not in charge usually, but they're seeing it all. I, I'm just so excited about, February 14th is a day, but it's also a journey. Like this happened because of February 14th. And this is happening all over the world, that these coalitions and these coming togethers are happening across all kinds of, of lines in every country, in India, in Bangladesh, um, in the Philippines. And, and I was just in you know, Mexico, Guatemala, and Lima, and I was actually in a square in Lima where 10,000 people were chanting Vahina and committing to rising because the mayor of Lima is this extraordinary woman who is creating exactly what we're talking about right here. So it's not just a day, it's a journey. And the journey to the 14th and after is what's important. The rising is a, is a, is a kind of emblem of, of that journey. And right now there's 177 countries signed up. Um, you know, someone was talking about the elections. You know, to me, that's all, we're just walking through that. What we're really doing is building movements. We're building movements. And I was looking on all the names on the internet of all the groups who have signed up around the world. And I just, I do this and I just sit and I weep because I remind myself all the time that we have built movements. We have massive movements all over the planet. The thing that, that you were saying is that we just haven't called it that yet. 
We haven't linked it as that yet. But that's what this rising is about. It's saying we are the movement. We are the people. This is the journey. And, and I feel so optimistic. I literally go to bed every night, and I see a million women and all the men who love them dancing. Billy.